I'm delighted to introduce the next session of Health Matters. This is going to be a provocative um, panel discussion on being an agent of change. And of course, Dr. Wendy Koster is our moderator. Dr. Koster is a familiar name in the occupational therapy world internationally. She is the professor and chair of the Department of Occupational Therapy at Boston University, Sargent College. Her scholarly interests include the development of child and youth with disabilities and outcome measures. She co-authored the Pediatric Evaluation of Disability Inventory, um, called the PD, and the School Function Assessment, two of the first standardized functional assessments designed specifically for children with disabilities and being used widely internationally. Dr. Koster is a fellow of the American Occupational Therapy Association, a member of the Academy of Research of the American Occupational Therapy Foundation, a recipient of the A. Jean Ayers Research Award, and the winner of the 2007 Eleanor Clark Slagle Lectureship Award. And that was from the American Occupational Therapy Association. So welcome, Wendy Koster. Hello, and thank you for being here today. There are major efforts underway currently in the United States to try to develop a more effective, efficient, and caring healthcare system. Now more than ever, we need visionary practitioners who can lead these efforts. The Occupational Therapy Program at Boston University has been devoted for decades to trying to develop leaders who can take on these roles in the profession. Today, we're delighted to share the experiences and insights of three of these leaders. Karen Turner and Brooke Howard are both graduates of our MSOT program. Karen Duddy is currently completing her post-professional occupational therapy doctorate. I've asked the presenters to, be, to share their involvement in innovation in their practice setting. What was the need that you saw and what did you do to respond to it? We'll begin with Karen Duddy, whose presentation is pre-recorded as she is in California and not at Boston right now. Good afternoon. I'm Karen Duddy. I'm very thankful for the opportunity to participate on this panel and talk a little bit about the work I'm doing at the Long Beach VA. Basically, I'm working on providing OT at the primary care level, but with a focus on function. My target population is veterans with chronic conditions. While there is much emphasis on lifestyle and healthy behaviors for people with chronic conditions, there is little attention given to a person's day-to-day -day functioning and keeping up with the usual routines and activities. This is important because when people begin to have health challenges, they start to give up things like going out with friends, going to the market, working on the car, and tending to the garden. Our routines, habits, hobbies, and daily self-care rituals those are what make up the rhythms of our lives and contribute to our health and well-being. OT. OT can help people keep up their desired routines and activities. But the system is set up to offer OT after an injury or illness in order to restore function, but not before, with the idea of preventing or slowing functional declines. So apparently I needed to change the system to make OT available earlier. For me, being an agent of change meant figuring out a way to go from here to there, from what is to what could be. In lean management, a basic strategy for improvement or transformation is to understand the current state of the process or system you are trying to improve. In this way, you can discover where to target your efforts as well as to recognize the needs of others and how to communicate and work with key people so that these changes can actually occur. Next, a vision of the desired future state, or where you want to go, provides direction and motivation for the work ahead. The OT doctoral program at BU gave me the tools I needed to create a compelling and informed vision. Such classes were the evidence-based practice, the theory, social policy, adult learning, health and, wel health and wellness, and of course, outcomes. Now, I thought I had a great idea, but you want to give people a reason to jump on board with your idea. In lean management, this is called a burning platform. The burning platform represents the serious issue or need that is important to the stakeholders or is causing them pain. 
high costs and frequent care for people with chronic conditions is certainly painful to the US healthcare system. The path from here to there, or strategy and next steps, takes a tremendous amount of effort and focus and can sometimes take years, especially when change involves systems and policies, or even something as seemingly benign as getting care earlier. It turns out that this is a major paradigm shift. A detailed strategy and specific ongoing action helps move us and our stakeholders along the journey. Some of the integration strategies that I've used include committee and event participation, fall prevention day, health promotion disease prevention committee participation. Um, I co-lead a chronic pain education class with the psychologist and the pharmacist and I started the very first primary care fair and we have had two major successful fairs since. Um, the hospital-wide summer of service fair, of course backpack awareness day and um, providing giveaways for the returning veterans. Uh, women's health staff meeting, attending those and getting to know everyone. And we do a lot of tabling which is very successful. We set up tables and promote OT in different ways around the hospital. Uh, recently, I'm working on a doc walk planning event. Uh, the doctors called me up and they had this idea to go around at lunchtime and walk with patients. And so um, they knew I planned things and so they called me up and there we go. Interestingly, the two doctors who are doing this and who called me are the ones giving me most of my um, consults so, or my orders, my referrals. So that's a great thing. Essentially, to innovate or create significant change, you need to have a clear vision and be a change agent. For me, this meant learn the culture and system, listen to others, build trust, be of service, communicate the vision, and maybe most importantly, focus and persist. Currently, OT has an office up in primary care, and we just started research on our group for veterans with chronic conditions with the chief of primary care as our principal investigator. We've accomplished a lot, but there is still a lot of work ahead. With that, I will conclude. My sincerest thank yous to Karen Jacobs for organizing this event and Wendy Coster for moderating this panel. Thank you and have a great remainder of the conference. Great, thank you, Karen. I'd also now like to ask our new, uh, other two panelists to introduce themselves very briefly and say where they are working and what their role is there. Hi, my name is Karen Turner, and I am an occupational therapist on the inpatient psychiatric unit at Massachusetts General Hospital. Hi, my name is Brooke Howard. I'm also an occupational therapist. I work at the Ivy Street School, which is a substantially separate school for young adults 14 to 22, and my current role there is the transition coordinator. Thank you. Karen, I wonder if you could, uh, as Karen Duddy did, tell us about the need that you saw um, in your setting and how you began to respond to that need. Sure, Wendy, thank you. So um, I began working on the inpatient psychiatric unit at MGH in 2011. And at that time, there was um, a need to begin to explore ways to reduce the use of seclusion and restraint on the unit. And myself and one of the psychiatric um, nurse specialists there and a psychologist developed a multidisciplinary team to start to examine um, the reasons why people were being restrained or secluded, um, factors that put them at risk for that, and started to develop a more uh, proactive approach. Uh, one of the things that I specifically did as an occupational therapist was start to re-examine um, how and when we began working with um, patients who were at high risk. So these are patients who were um, actively experiencing symptoms of psychosis, might be feeling um, very upset or agitated or very confused. And so um, one of the things that I did was um, reprioritize when we saw them. Previously, it was thought that um, these patients patients were not able to participate in therapy and therefore we would defer them until their symptoms improved. However, I felt like I could make a difference um, in helping them to feel more calm on the unit and engage them in different activities, even if it was just some um, sensory activities and movement activities. And so we began seeing them on um, their first day of admission. And part of what I did on that first day of admission was to help to create what we call a coping care plan. 
And the coping care plan just includes thinking about what are the person's triggers for stress um, and anxiety and um, their, what are their symptoms and really what are the best ways to communicate with them as well as what strategies will be most useful to them and most helpful for um, helping them to feel more calm and relaxed. And so these were strategies that um, nursing would be able to use um, anytime or throughout the day with the person as well as um, with us within OT. And so um, we had a lot of success in creating those care plans and um, also just looked at other systems and made some systems changes and began to create some culture change. Um, and so now we've been doing that for um, just about five years now and have experienced a dramatic decrease in our restraint use. So at the time we were above the state average as far as other um, psychiatric hospitals in Massachusetts. And now we are um, have been below the state average um, for the last two to three years, which is really exciting. And um, so that was really one way that I saw myself as an agent of change, was just trying to think about ways to expand the role of occupational therapy on the psychiatric unit. Um, and when that was so successful, I started to explore ways to do that in the rest of the hospital because um, many patients around the hospital experience confusion or agitation, especially people who um, are experiencing some delirium or a, a new um, traumatic brain injury, person with a traumatic brain injury. And so um, I started working on some of the medical units as well in more of a like consultative role. Just to, So it was a new way in which we were bringing behavioral and sensory interventions um, to um, units and working with patients just to help them participate in their role as a patient but also participate in care and activities and um, try to help them to um, be calm as possible. So that was a really different thing for within the acute care setting um, as an OT and that's something that I continue to build in my practice now. That's very exciting, Karen. Thank you very much. Brooke, would you share with us what you've been doing? Sure, thank you. So the Ivy Street School is a residential school, and when I was first hired there as an OT about six years ago, the occupational therapist was working primarily during the school hours and seeing students individually for component-based goals like handwriting, um, sometimes maybe something slightly more functional, for this age group like cutting or spreading, but primarily the goals were component-based and um, not necessarily meaningful for the students. So students were not engaging in OT sessions and also the rest of the school wasn't really aware of what OT was or what our capacity was for making change. So th my first step at Ivy Street was to really look at the role of OT, considering that we're a residential program. We're also community-based, and we are also looking to transition our students into adulthood. So in my mind, I felt like OT could really work in, in all aspects of the school. So the first thing I did was try to first slowly chip away at all of the IEP goals. So I was starting to shift the focus away from some of these more component-based goals and towards some bigger picture goals that were more engaging and more meaningful to <clears throat> our students. And then in addition to that, I switched most of my services away from being pull-out services and um, towards being push-in. So that model was pushing into classrooms, pushing into job sites, pushing into um, community outings with the classrooms, and also pushing into the residents. So the initial stages of kind of making some more cultural changes at Ivy Street really involved a lot of uh, big picture thinking and also education of staff and raising awareness of what OTs could do and um, what you know our role could be there. And then since then, we've grown our OT department. We're now looking um, at hiring our fourth OT. So I went from being the only OT to now a um, staff of four OTs because the OTs are really working in the residents, in the community, um, in, and in the education team, supporting curriculum development, life skill development. And part of that, which is the piece that I've, I'm sort of specializing in at this point, was looking more closely at the way we're considering the transition of our students into young adulthood. So transition in the greater sphere of education is becoming more and more 
um, important and there's a lot more evidence looking at what's effective and what's not effective. And we were certainly one of those schools that was going through the motions um, saying that we were focusing on transition skills but not actually doing things effectively. So we've been looking at different models of engaging families and students in their transition in a more meaningful way. One of the biggest challenges that we're facing is how to engage families in the transition in a meaningful way. So in my new role as transition coordinator, um, we've created some templates for transition meetings and, it, you know, they're really a way to do structured goal setting with families the same way that you would with a client. So we're not using the COPUM, but it's a very similar type of process. You know, what are your priorities? What's really meaningful to you? Where do you think you're struggling? And it's we've seen great results in terms of helping parents manage their anxiety around the transition, helping the team focus on very specific objectives, and then helping the students feel like they have a lot more agency in the process. Um, We've also done a lot more student-centered goal setting. We, we started that a few years back um, to help students be more engaged in their transition process as well. And finally, we've looked at different models of addressing transition skill development. So we have one, one classroom that has a very specific group of students that all have high-functioning autism who have passed their MCAS and are preparing their life skills. Um, so we Two, this is our third year, so two years ago developed that classroom with push-in services from OT and speech. Um, and then out of that came a summer program that I've run for the last three summers that provides a residential component, also with structured goal setting um, and more integrated community opportunities. So I think in terms of being an agent of change, the process has been working from the ground up and then also looking at the very big picture and um, engaging our students and our families in, the, in their time at Ivy Street in a way that's most meaningful to them so that our outcomes have been much better. Thank you so much, Brooke and Karen. And it's clear from what both of you described that your leadership really got that effort going. but. I know that both of you work in settings that require a real team effort to achieve the goals of the program. So I wonder if you could describe a little bit, how did you go about securing that support of the team? And what was the response you got? And how has it progressed since then? Karen, you want to begin? Sure. Um, so at the time, our kind of sensory program was um, really already quite well established on our unit. And so, um, you know, I think that we had demonstrated through um, some of the other inter like interventions with clients that were um, not as sick at the time that these could be really powerful and useful interventions. So I think in that way, we had had some time to um, kind of build and establish ourselves within the kind of multidisciplinary team that we already had gained some trust in that way. Um, but I think it is, it has been a process over time of just um, ongoing collaboration, I think has been one of the most important things as far as um, collaborating with the nurse, um, you know, when there is somebody who has, um, more agitated or is very upset and that the nurse that's caring for them is really in, in charge of trying to help to keep that person calm. Um, you know, building trust with that nurse and collaborating together so that she can see I'm not going in and, you know, creating more agitation or creating more upset in that person too. And so I just think some of those initial um, examples help to build and establish what we were able to provide. Um, and I think that was one way that we were, you know, kind of became part of the team. Brooke, you were really changing um, the team's perception of OT. How did you go about uh, doing that with them? So I think that the first, in the first stage, um, similar to what Karen is describing, it was really sh leading by example, showing, um, team members that what OT could do and starting with people probably who who are willing to collaborate most readily. So maybe, for example, I can remember one classroom teacher who was really on board with doing some community integration work with me. And so then 
once other classrooms could see how successful that was, then they were interested in that. And it was really very slow um, because it was also category by category. So first community integration in one classroom, then the other teachers were interested in that. But you know, if I suggested something like a cooking group, we had to wait for that. We had to first do the community stuff. And I sort of had to prove that we could work together and that we were all on the same team. Um, I think that traditionally OT was seen as, you know, well, you're pulling the student out, you're taking time away from what my goals are for the student or my academic goals. So um, I had to establish that we are all working on the same, with the same goals in mind. And then um, it's, you know, to be completely honest in terms of building that team up on the residential floor, um, it, it's, it's been a real work in progress. Some of the things that have been effective are, probably the most effective strategy has been situating an occupational therapist on the residential floor during residential time um, for treatment, but also to be there as a resource. So being able to, similar to what Karen has described with the nurse, um, being able to say, we're, we're, we know what you're dealing with and we're willing to work with you while you're dealing with this and we're not trying to take you away from that or make things more difficult for you by adding something. So that's taken a lot of time to, to really understand what the roles and responsibilities are of each, each type of staff person and uh, what their priorities are and what the different pulls are and what the pressures are and what the burnout's like and how hard, you know, and then also keeping tabs on the pulse of the students. So we've had a number of restraints this week. It's been a really hard week, probably not the best time to go in and talk about, you know, looking at our approach to sh structuring showering on the unit or something like that. Um, so understanding the staff as, as part of who we're working with and making sure that they also feel um, taken care of. And part of that too is then hearing from them, what do you think that the students need? What's important to you? And also what are you interested in? And then engaging them around their interests. We've had staff that have got a number of residential staff who have gone on to pursue an education in OT. And so finding those people early on, somebody says, oh, I'm really interested in, you know, how to help this student clean their room and, and just going with that, even if that's, you know, not necessarily my priority, but that empowers them to then engage with us in a more collaborative way. So it's it's been um, sort of a piece by piece by piece process with the team, and, and we still we still have setbacks, and then we have to kind of reestablish what are we doing, what's you know where are the problems here. We hire someone new, they have to build relationships again. So um, it's a constant work in progress, but it needs a lot of um, nurturing, I think, to continue to be effective. Thank you. That was very, very interesting and, and helpful, hopefully, to people who are, are in similar situations. We have a, a few minutes left, and I would like to sort of shift the focus a little bit. Um, those of us who are educators also want to make sure that what we're doing is effective. And I was wondering whether there are particular experiences that you had in your educational program here at Boston University that you found were particularly helpful as you were undertaking these leadership roles? Or were there other experiences that really uh, helped you move forward in what you were trying to do? Karen? Um, so I was very lucky to have really many opportunities when I was here at BU. Um, one of them that was really empowering for me was with um, writing a thesis under Ellen Cohn and Jane Kumar. Um, from the Kumar Center, and it was about um, mothers who had sensory processing challenges and some of the challenges that they were facing as they had children who also had sensory processing challenges. And um, I think a big thing that I took away from that was just the role in being an advocate for a population that really hadn't been well represented in the research yet, and just how really empowering it was to be able to look at their stories and um, create kind of work from that that then could be shared so that there could be a better understanding of their needs. Um, and I think that's, you know, very similar to some of, you know, what I've, the kind of work that I've tried to do as well as just, you know, trying to understand the experience of the person 
um, who is experiencing psychosis or severe agitation and trying to advocate for them through creative ways. Um, and so I think that was really one of the most powerful and empowering things I did. And um, and I think also what's really great about um, the program here was there's just so much support and mentorship that I think when you have belie- people who believe in you and you feel like continue to believe in you after you leave the school, then it just um, gives you a sense of confidence that um, I don't really think, think I would have had otherwise. So I think it was just having the mentorship and some of those opportunities that really supported me in um, having the confidence to take a leap as a leader, too. Thank you. Brooke, how about you? Sure. So I, uh, during my time at BU, um, participated in a Schweitzer Fellowship, which I think, uh, and I was very well supported by by the faculty here to do that. That certainly gave me an opportunity to look for an area of need in the community and then try to understand the needs of an entire organization and then to go down to the smaller piece of the organization and start there and addressing the need and kind of just work piece by piece by piece. Um, so my project was focused on wellness in, in an adolescent residential program, this is similar to where I am now, although my focus was different. So that was one opportunity that um, I was lucky to take advantage of that really gave me a little bit of practice with this process. But I think that the you know, thinking about this question, the message throughout my whole education here around the clinical reasoning process and how to think about a problem and also how to make sure that what you're doing with somebody is meaningful and and to be not afraid to step back and say, you know what I'm this isn't working. So we probably need to step back because there's a piece here that I'm missing if it's not working um, rather than blame it on, oh, you know, well, the, you know, this adolescent's not participating or they don't care about OT or it's their behavior or whatever. Instead of, you know, going down that path, I think um, certainly I was taught and it was reinforced throughout my time here to to stop as a clinician and think about like, well, what are we really doing here? And maybe we're doing, probably we're doing something wrong if this person who has a lot of needs and is in a vulnerable situation is disengaging with us. It's probably not them. It's probably our approach. Um, and then also the the confidence to be persistent with that. So so if something you try doesn't work, to take another step back and try it again and keep trying and keep looking at um, all of the different parts instead of getting really focused on one small component and kind of going down that path without looking back. I think um, it's it's sort of that way of thinking that was what was most beneficial to me in my practice. Um, also what Karen mentioned about uh, having relationships with faculty members. I certainly, I think my first week at Ivy Street contacted um, some of my old professors and had the OT practice framework out. And I mean, and I had been practicing for six years already, but I still felt like, oh man, this is a huge, where do I even start? And what am, what are we even doing here? And being able to um, call back on that expertise and feel like I was supported in making a big change and and having that support to think through that change in a careful way, um, I think is something that has been just invaluable to me for, for my entire career. Thank you both. That was really very interesting to hear. And and w- what it makes me think of is how much of innovation is just the, the courage to keep thinking about a problem and you know not settle if it doesn't seem like a, you've quite figured it out yet and, and to keep going. And I think you both have and, and obviously will do that. So I appreciate your sharing your um, experience with us today. and. Hope that the audience has also been encouraged to keep thinking about that problem that's bothering you and think about whether there might be a completely new way that, that you could take on and, and lead the way really to, to a new and better way of serving the, the people that we serve. So thank you very much for attending and that is the end of our session.